The devil is busy, but God is busier. Amen? Amen. We have to learn how to be busier than the devil. And so this morning, we are going to go into the second way of being able to withstand the devil. So I would like for you this morning to turn to James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. I believe this verse is going to bless our lives this morning. James chapter 4, verse 7. When you have it this morning, say amen. amen. And the Bible reads, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, the hearers, and especially the doers of his word. And this morning, we are going to take for a simple subject matter right here from the text, resist the devil. Resist the devil. I want us to understand this morning as we get into this book of James, as it pertains to resisting the devil. We are very capable of doing this. Because I think James is telling us something this morning very powerful that we need to understand the power of the devil and know that he actually does not have power over us and that God himself has given us all that we need to be able to resist or oppose the devil. The devil is a master manipulator. He is the solicitor of evil, but we are something even greater than the devil because that which is in us is greater than that which is in the world. I don't think we understand sometimes what a privilege and an honor it is to be a child of God. When we are a child of God, we can resist everything that the devil throws at us. We just have to understand that whatever it is that he makes us, or I shouldn't say make, whatever it is he entices us or he tempts us with to fall away from God, we have to understand that's not coming from him, that's coming from us. And so what James is dealing with as Christians If we want to resist the devil, what we first have to deal with is what is inside of us. And we're not talking about the spirit of God. We're talking about our desires, our passions. We have to identify those things and make sure that those things don't come before the priority of doing the will of God. And so there is no better person to tell us about this this morning than James, the brother of Jesus, who himself was not a believer in the beginning. But once Jesus died and resurrected, thank God that James became a believer. Amen. And James is one of these people. He has a very practical letter, very short, very practical. He is. There are two things we say about the book of James. One, it is the Proverbs of the New Testament. If you want to find some great proverbial sayings, go to the book of James in the New Testament. He helps us to understand how to live as Christians, faith and action. And one of the things that he's encouraging in the book of James is he doesn't want us to be worldly Christians. He doesn't want us to be Christians by proclamation, but the world by how we're living. That's why he says faith without works is dead, because some people say believing is enough. And then James, I'm telling y'all this morning, James would be someone in some of these congregations people would be so mad at because someone would say, well, I believe in God. And James would come back and say, well, even the devil believes the demons believe. We don't never want to put ourselves on the level of the demons and the devil. We are above the devil and the demons. We are the children of God. We don't just proclaim faith. We live faith because we have been saved by faith. Amen. We have been saved by grace through faith. And so we see this thing where James, there's a lot of people. I talked about it in Sunday school. Some of the great theologians of the past, they didn't like James. 
Because James was basically saying something that I think that people still have a hard time grasping. Your actions, Jesus said, a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. Every action that we do in our life tells people what our faith is. Everything we say tells people what our faith is. And so James is encouraging this, and he is encouraging this not only through reproof, rebuke, and also through exhortation. He wants to help people to understand how do we live? What is the cure for worldliness, and how can we withstand the devil? I want to show us something in James 4, 1 and 2 as we begin to move down because James is about to build a very powerful stance of how to withstand the devil. But the first thing he wants to look at is he wants to deal with the inside of all of us. He wants us to look at the inside. Because we talked about this morning that temptation, according to James and James 1.14 and so forth, that when a man is drawn away, he's not drawn away. Watch this. He's not drawn away because of the devil. He's drawn away because of his own lust. A woman drawn away by her own lust. Whatever it is that draws us away from God, I know people like to say the devil made me do it, but the devil doesn't make us do it. He entices us to do what we already want to do. This is why he couldn't tempt Jesus, because Jesus didn't want to disobey God. You can't make somebody do something they don't want to do. Typically, we're convincing people to do what they already want to do. And so this is what the devil does. And so James begins to deal with, hey, let's deal psychologically. How is it that the devil can get so many people? Look at what James says in James 4.1. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Are we seeing this? James didn't say, hey. Your problems are beginning with the devil. Your, problems is, is, your problem is the devil. No. James said the issue is you. The issue is you're losing the battle of your own mind. You're double-minded. There are things that you, you proclaim God, but there are things that you want in the world. And so what happens is you go for the things in the world rather than obeying God. One of the things that I have realized of why it is so hard sometimes to help people as it pertains to faith and truth is because truth is not something or even faith is not something tangible. We walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. So what we find ourselves in a lot of instances, we're trying to tell people about something that they can't see. And so people struggle with what they can't see. But isn't it strange what people do with seeing? They paint a vision in their minds of how they want something to be. And a lot of times of what they want something to be, they can see some of those things and they feel like, well, if I can just put my hands on it or I can make this thing happen, then I can have exactly what I want. So what happens is, is that people begin to fight over passions. We may not realize what we're fighting in this world. It's not a battle of flesh and blood. We're battling thinking. (laughs) We're battling ideas. We're battling principles. We're battling things. We're we're thinking we're battling each other as in flesh and blood, black and white, yellow and green. No, we're battling ideas and thinking and all of these different things. And James is saying something. You're battling your own desires and lusts and pleasures. He says you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And what he is saying is you do not have because you do not ask God. And you're not asking God with the right heart. We can ask God for anything that we want to ask God for, but God is not going to give us everything that we ask him for. What God expects from us is for our hearts to be changed so that we, we, when we go to God, we're actually praying for the right things. 
When your heart has been changed by God, you don't pray for frivolous things. You don't even pray for things that you can see because most things, if you want a new car in the grand scheme of things, if you got the money, you can go get that new car. Can't you? You better believe you can. There are a lot of things that you can get without praying to God for even though we know God gives us everything. But when we are truly praying, we're not praying all the time for the things that we can touch or the things that's going to make us better. You think about what we do this morning. When we pray, what are we doing? Aren't we praying for people to be healed? We're praying for things that can't necessarily be touched. We're praying for God's supernatural power to reach out and heal people. We're asking for things from God. Notice, I, 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 I don't think I've ever seen someone stand up at church and pray, ask the church to pray for me to get something. We're typically praying for someone else to get something, aren't we? Praying for ourselves to be better. We're not praying for those tangible things. We're not praying for pleasurable things. We're praying for peace. We're praying for things that will bring us joy. And so James says something here. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? He says, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James is saying something. We can't live in both worlds. Now, we can live in the world, but we can't live of the world. And so we can't be walking around living like the world talking about Jesus. We are a walking contradiction when we do that. Walking around saying praise God while not praising God in our life. Living a life that's not reflective of God, but always bringing up God. James is saying something. No, that is not what we do. He says, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. And I think that James is saying something, man. God is jealous for us. I don't know in here who's all married, but let me tell you something. No man or woman wants their spouse to cheat on them. That makes us feel a type of way to even think about it, doesn't it? You know, James is saying the same thing about God and his spirit. That the spirit of God yearns for us. That the spirit of God wants us to follow God because why we are married to God. God doesn't want his children cheating on him or the church as a whole is the bride of Christ. Christ doesn't want the church cheating on him with the world. However you feel about your spouse, then think about that. Jesus feels like that about the church tenfold. And so God is saying something about us is that God wants us to do right. And this is going to catapult us into something that James is saying that is so clever. You have got to study the Bible and see how the Bible plays on words. So it is so beautiful how the Bible plays on words because Notice what James has been talking about when he's talking about desires and lust. He's talking about pride. We typically have a lot of pride in whatever thing that we believe the most in. That thing will drive us. We'll defend it. We'll do everything for it. And so James is talking about personal pride. And when we talk about pride, we're talking about unwarranted, uh, unwarranted glory. People always want glory for something that they really don't deserve. Unwarranted arrogance. People think they're entitled, that there is something that they ought to have is what James is giving, giving a response to. But he's trying to help us to understand as the children of God. We have the greatest gift that God ever gave. He gave his only begotten son and gave us salvation. If we could just learn to be content with that 
and feed all of our energy into that, how much greater would we be in the eyes of God? And we wouldn't be focused on the world because we know that the world is perishing. We would be trying to bring people out of the world. But our focus would be God. Our focus would be heaven. Our focus would be edification. Our focus would be evangelism. Our focus would be our transformation. Our focus would be where are we going rather than where we are. And so James is about to make a play on words. Look, he says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resist the proud. He resist the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Are we following something that James is saying? That God gives grace and favor to those who follow him, humble themselves and obey him. God gives them favor, favor, rather than the folk who are the most prideful in their desires and their lust and their goal. Think about this. They want to make themselves great. They want to do what makes them great. They want to do what fulfills them. No, God resists the proud. Because watch what he says. And this is our first point. How do we withstand the devil? We should resist being proud. We should resist being proud. Why? Because God gives grace to those who are humble, proud, unwarranted importance. We have to make sure that we never look at ourselves more important than we are. Because the moment we start feeling like people owe us something, guess what happens? We're going to start acting like people owe us something. And all of a sudden, we're going to be walking around like every time someone doesn't do something for us or say something to us or treat us a certain way, we're going to be all bent out of shape. Why? Because we have a desire for something that is unwarranted. The Bible tells us something beautiful, doesn't it? It says treat people like you want to be treated. It doesn't say you're going to treat people like you are going to be treated. And sometimes we'll take that and we'll get bent out of shape about it because we'll even tell somebody, well, I'm being so nice to you, but you won't be nice to me. And we should never let anyone get us out of our character. We are the children of God. We don't care about how people, and I'm not saying that we like mistreatment, but just because we get mistreatment don't mean we're going to dish mistreatment. Why? Because James is going to catapult us into something that is so powerful because he says here on our next point, how do we withstand the devil? Simple, submit to God. Amen. Submit to God. So I want you to see something very quickly. We're going to run through these. In James 4, 7 through 10, James is going to give us 10 quick commands on how to withstand the devil. I've broken down three points, but I'm going to show you all 10 commands very quickly that you might not notice that are there. But this is the cure for worldliness. This is the cure to help us not be infested by the world. And this is how we can resist the devil. Watch this in 4, 7 through 10. So I've already told you the first one. Submit to God. And number two is resist the devil, which will be our second point. But he says, therefore, submit to God. Now, when the Bible tells us to submit to God, we have to acknowledge first, we know that God is a friend to us, isn't he? God is a friend to us. But more so, we also have to recognize that he is our father. The word submit is a military term from the biblical times that means to fall into rank. 
And when the Bible says submit to God, it is telling us that in our everyday life, we have to recognize who God is. If we say that Jesus is the Lord of our life, if God is our father, then we know that even though we are the children of God, we are beneath God. Amen. We are servants of God. And so in everything we do, listen to what he's telling us. In everything we do, we need to submit to God. We need to put God first. Put God first in everything we do, every decision that we make, everything that we say, every move that we make, we put God first. We submit to God. Why? He's the father. And through Jesus, Jesus is the Lord of our life. And the spirit of God is working in our life. How? Through the word of God. How do we submit to God? By obeying the word of God. And the works that we do in our faith, our works have to all be based on the word of God. James is telling us something so simple, but we struggle with it, don't we? We struggle with it. We struggle with it because the war, we are not realizing something. I remember something that Tony Romo said. And Tony Romo acknowledged something about when his position was taken by Dak Prescott. Tony Romo said that the battle was not with Dak Prescott. The battle was with the man in the mirror. We always think that the battle is with the person who is standing in front of us, don't we? The person is standing across from us, the, the, the family member, the, the co-worker, the, the person in the supermarket being rude to us. We think that that's the war. And you'll notice what we'll do during those times, won't we? We will turn that focus towards that war, won't we? We'll turn towards that person. And then if we're not careful, we'll become passionate about, I'm going to make it my business. To get back at that person. I had a cousin that got so mad one time that somebody cut him off in traffic. He weaved through a funeral to catch up to the person that cut, up, cut him off. He became passionate about something so small. Don't we do this type of stuff all the time? We make Ant hills into mountains in our life. Yes, we start battling things and we let these things consume us. But James is telling us something so powerful. The battle isn't with that person. The battle is between you and yourself. Yeah. We're the problem. And every time we find a mess, we have to stop always looking at other folk and look at the me in mess. Do y'all know mess is spelled M-E-S-S? -S? We have to find the me in the mess. Because I can't control the SS folk. I can't control them folk. And we start consuming ourselves, don't we? I have to control the SS folk. No, you can't control the SS folk, but who you can control is the M-E, me. I can control how I respond to every situation. Y'all don't realize how much this series is helping me. Some folk make it about them. No, I'm talking about me. Because I have to understand like you have to understand. We can't control anyone but me. That's all I can control. And all those other SS folk, I got to let them be the SS folk because me is a child of God. 
And James is saying something that when you find yourself in situations of where the devil is enticing you to submit to your own passion, your own pride, when you are wanting to submit to the things of the world, retaliation, revenge, and all of these things that are of the world, he is saying when you find yourself in that situation, no, submit to God. Don't look at yourself and say, I deserve this and I deserve that. No, you say, I'm a child of God. And I am not going to submit to the devil. I refuse to do the things of the devil. I will do the things of God, which drives us to our next point. Resist the devil. He says, resist the devil. Do y'all know I'm telling us the Bible doesn't tell us something that we're not capable of. It doesn't. You get people who will say, yeah, that's easy to say, but it's not. E the Bible does not tell us anything we cannot do. Amen. The power to resist the devil is in us if we are children of God. And he is just saying something. When you read James 4, 4, remember I said adulterers? He says adulterers and trespassers. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So he just told us something. Guess what? If God resists the proud and if God resists the world, then I, we're going to do some biblical math, aren't we? If God resists the pride in the world, then the way to resist the devil, who is the God of this world, is to resist the world. That's how you do it. You resist the world. You resist the love of the world. You resist those things in it because James is saying something. Don't get it twisted. James isn't saying God is our enemy. God can never be our enemy. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Do y'all know that God gave his only begotten son not so that saved folk could be saved, so that sinners could be saved? Because we were all sinners before we came into God. He gave his only begotten son so we could be saved. So God does not want to be our enemy. No, God is saying something. When we love the world more than God, we make ourselves God's enemy. It's not him who is making us into his enemy. We make ourselves into God's enemy. And so he is saying something. No, the way you resist the devil is do not be a friend of the world. Because I know what's going on here because James is saying something because the devil, I, I, I'm telling you, the more you think about the devil and his craftiness, he makes the saved feel unsaved. Makes the saved doubt they're saved. Oh, but the unsaved gives them all the confidence in the world. He makes the saved, he makes the unsaved feel saved. I'm not going to take credit again. Some of these people on Facebook do use social media for good things. And they come up with some of the most clever memes. And I love them. And I've been sharing a lot of them. But you think about the people on the day of Pentecost. This is a meme that someone said that on the day of Pentecost, people were asking, what must I do to be saved? The devil has programmed people to say, no, what can I do and still be saved? Folk want to know, how much devilry can I do? How much? What's the breaking point? How much wrong can I do and still be saved? No, faith without works is dead. Amen. Faith without works is dead. It's not about doing more good than evil. It's not about any of those things. It's about obeying the Lord. Submitting to God, resisting the devil, resisting the world. We have to oppose the world. We do. Not the, not the people in it, but the system. The system that hates God. A system that proclaims God and then acts against God. We have to oppose that system. James gives us a final point, And I love what he says here. James says... If we want to resist the devil, draw near to God. Draw near. How, how do we draw near to God, church? 
Can we float into the sky? Can we ask God into our hearts as some people have deceived the world? Can we ask God into our hearts? How do we get near to God? Because I want you to see something this morning that is so powerful. The word, the word draw, this whole phrase of draw near to God, it is used typically in worship context. Isn't it strange one of the simplest ways to draw near to God and so many people disregard it? Well, one way is to come and worship God. I'm going to give us something here that a lot of people don't understand. They think they can get to God without us. You can't get to God without going through his people. If you're going to draw near to God, you have to draw near to God's people. You want to know why James is talking about this whole thing? Why there are wars among you? He's talking about dissension in the church. He's saying, if you want to draw near to God and draw near to one another, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Isn't it strange? He said, God opposes the proud. Do y'all know what he just said about the proud? God pushes them away. He's not pushing them away because he's evil. God is saying, no, don't come to me how you want to come to me. You come to me how I want you to come to me. And when you draw near to me, I don't want you to be the star in your own eye. I don't want it to be all about you when you come to me. I keep saying the same thing about worship. I love Sam's attitude when he sings. There's a reason why I'm telling you, I put my whole being in the preaching. I put everything into it. I'm not passionate about it to where it's the main focus of my life, but preaching the word is a main focus of my life. I'm not looking for what preaching can do for me. I'm looking for what preaching will do for all of us. Amen. Singing is not about, Sam is not up here trying to edify himself. He's trying to edify all of us. And the Bible is saying something. When we draw near to God, we do the things that will draw all of us near to God. We put God first in our life. He says, draw near to God. I want us to understand this morning. I say it all the time. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Amen. But I want you to see something here that James focuses on. As we draw near to God, repentance should be a mainstay in our life. It should be a mainstay. And I'm telling you this because people get repentance confused. People think repentance is a changing of a behavior. It's not. Repentance is the changing of the mind that turns away from the behavior. If you will turn your mind towards God, you don't have to worry about stopping the behavior. It'll take care of itself. See, when we try to stop something without God, then we focus on that thing more than God. See, a lot of people, when they're trying to get over addictions, it's so hard for them because the addiction has got them so hard. They have nothing else to focus on. But the Bible is saying that in all of your issues, don't make the main focus the issue. You have to find something greater than the issue. And in our life, God is greater than every issue. Isn't it beautiful when Christians overcome illnesses? Talk to any of them who've ever overcome an illness. Those who are truly faithful, they'll never tell you, oh, I did it on my own. Boy, I was strong. I did this. You know what they'll tell you? God. They'll tell you, I put my faith in God. And I said, God, wherever this goes, it's going. But if you take me, I'm going to be with you. That's what people do. And James is saying something here. He gives us 
three more of these issues. He says, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts. You know what he just told us? If we want to be saved, church, we must repent. Turn from the world and turn towards God. And so James just said something. He says, draw near to God. How do we do it? Cleanse your hands. Tell me what it is that you're doing wrong. Stop doing it. Change your mind. Say, I'm going to follow God rather than myself. I'm going to follow God more than people. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cleanse my hands. I'm going to wash my hands of this sin. He says, you sinners, he says, look, purify your hearts. Look at this church. You know what he just told us? Look inside of yourself. I had to do this to myself the last couple of you. Look inside of you. Your problems don't begin with the problem. The problem begins with you. The problem for me is my response. The problem for you is your response. How do we respond to anything? That is more than half the battle. If you will respond righteously, you'll be amazed at how you can deal with your problem so much easier. Amen. But if you are the focus of your problems, if you are the focus of everything going on in your life, you're going to struggle with it. Because guess what? You can't fix everything on your own. You must submit to God and allow him to do it. And the only way we can have our hearts purified, he says, purify your hearts, you double minded. You already just said, stop living in the world and trying to live with God, too. Be all in on God. Because God, whether we accept it or not, do y'all know God is all in on us? I don't know if you're familiar with poker, and we are not advocating gambling. Amen, we shouldn't be gambling. But there's a term that when a gambler knows he has a hand that's going to win, he pushes in all the chips. Do y'all know Jesus, that God pushed in all the chips with Jesus? He pushed them all in. He said, this is it. This hand's going to win. I'm pushing Jesus all the way in. Anyone who accepts it, they won. They have hit the jackpot. He is telling us, purify your hearts. How do you do it? With the word of God. We can't cleanse our own hearts. We can't purify our own hearts. We have to have that done by the word of God. Because think about this. I won't break this all the way down, but the Hebrew writer even told us, he said, look, Hebrews 10, 19. He says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Look, let us draw near. You know, the Hebrew writer was saying, I know that you're facing persecution. But don't go away from God in your persecution. Draw near to God. Don't stop worshiping. Keep on worshiping. Don't stop meeting together. Keep on meeting together. Don't stop living for Christ. Keep on living and proclaiming Christ. Because that's how you draw near to God. And look at what he says. With a true heart. Are we seeing this? A heart that has been changed by the spirit of God through the word of God. Because I'm telling you, the devil in your persecution, watch what he does. He always wants you to feel like doing something, you're doing something wrong. The next line is the one that gets me. He says, draw near to God with full assurance. You know what he just said? Draw near to God knowing you're saved. We ought to come here on Sunday not to be saved. We come here because we are saved. And everything in our life, we ought to do it not to be saved, but because we are saved. Amen. Amen. We're doing it because we are saved. The faith that comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of God, that word saves us when we answer the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you want to be saved, what do we do? We confess that Jesus is the son of God, meaning he is the Lord of our life. Amen. I think James is saying something that if the Lord, if Jesus is the Lord of our life, then live like it. Then we are baptized for the remission of our sins and the reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit of God through the word of God. And those of us who endure until the end shall be saved. But James is telling us something simple. 
we can endure until the end. If we will just resist the devil. And the way we do that is through following God. Amen. So if you're here this morning, you have not answered the gospel of Jesus Christ. We employ to do so this morning. And for those of us in the church. I know many of us. And I talk to many of us apart from each other. And I know we are all going through trials and tribulations in our life. And I'm telling you, you can't get through those things on your own. Not only do you need God in your trials and tribulations, but you need the people of God in your trials and tribulations. And if we will draw near to God through one another, God can help us solve everything we're dealing with. Amen. As we stand and sing the song of invitation.